Hey, welcome to the start of the video. This is the part where I try to make the video seem fun to start off. You're like, wow, I want to keep watching this. What's he going to say next? This is interesting. Have we gotten there yet? Are you on board? I don't really care. We're starting this thing. At jbleaker09 said, how to be Christian and Trent Horn. Have you all seen the latest from Jeff Durbin of Apologia Studios? I enjoy and am learning much with your separate interactions with Mike Winger and would love to hear your response to Pastor Jeff. Well, we hear it How to Be Christian saw this tweet from at jbleaker09, and we're like, you know what? We're going to watch that video. We watched Jeff Durbin's video. We started writing out a script. We were like three-fourths of the way done. And then, <laughs> then, uh, Trent Horn puts out his video. A little show off. Great job, Trent. Nice, nice work. No, seriously, nice work. Nice work. I don't think my tone's getting the point across here. It's actually a good video. Go check it out. We've got the link in the description. Like his video. Subscribe to his channel. Actually, before you do that, practice on my channel because I don't want you doing any sloppy subscribes for Trent, all right? So while you're here, click the subscribe button. It's right under the video. Hit the notification bell, then click all. Click the like button. It's going to look like this. Get that practice in. Do not go to Trent's channel unprepared, okay? If I hear that you were just clicking around the like button on this channel because you weren't ready for it, that's not on me. I'm trying to help you out here. I want you to practice. I want you to click the like button on this video just so you're a pro at it when you get to his channel. It's not self-serving. I'm trying to help you. Did they buy that? Seriously though, Mr. Horn, if you're watching, great video response to Jeff Durbin. I mean, no hard feelings. We just, we put a lot of work into ours and then you, you kind of pulled that out from under us, but no, it's not a big deal. Okay, it's not. It's just, it's just not. All right, I mean, you are my sworn enemy now. We're arch nemesis and that's, it's just how it has to be. All right, there will be repercussions, but great video is really what I'm trying to say here. But watch your back. Anyway, in watching Jeff Durbin's video, we did hear Jeff say something that we found to be interesting. Pastor James is talking about how he will look at me and from the from the uh, congregation and give me. It is hard, I will say, having your teacher and your hero and your mentor always sort of sitting there watching you in the front row as you're teaching. It's really not fair. But there's another there's a flip side to that coin. Because he's my teacher, my mentor, my hero of the faith, and all the rest. If anything is wrong in what I'm teaching, you can blame him. So. <laughs> So yeah, since Mr. Durbin isn't responsible for his own actions, we're going to go to the source of Jeff's false information, and that is a Mr. James White. Why am I not surprised? We've looked at Mr. White's false teachings before on this channel. We have videos on those. Feel free to click the links in the descriptions to check out the nonsense he's pushing out there. But it looks like he's got more false teachings for us to cover, so I am a Bible-believing Christian, and our Protestant for the day is Mr. James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries. This is Christian versus Protestant on 2 Timothy 3, round 2! I fell off a cliff as I was saying that. All right, so as mentioned before, Protestants have a bunch of false teachings surrounding 2 Timothy 3, so we'll be doing different rounds on this topic. In the past, we've looked at Matt Slick's Protestant view on this. If you want to check that out, the link is in the description. Mr. White takes a different approach to the verse, which is equally as interesting. So we're going to check that out today. One thing that both Matt Slick and Mr. White have in common is that they're both trying to use 2 Timothy 3 to prove Sola Scriptura. So what is Sola Scriptura? We're going to have Mr. White tell you. All right, what Sola Scriptura is, what it is, the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. Since they are theonustos, God-breathed, they are, by definition, ultimate authority. For there can be no higher authority than God himself. All other rules of faith, creeds, councils, or anything else produced by the church herself is subject to the ultimate correction of God's word. That is what sola scriptura means. All right, so Mr. White thinks that the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. Now, it's important to realize here that Mr. White's saying they're the sole infallible rule of faith. Mr. White is not saying that the scriptures are the sole rule of faith for the church. Mr. White does believe there are other rules of faith for the church, but what Sola Scriptura says, and what Mr. White believes, is that the only rule of faith out there that's infallible is the scriptures. Which, if that were true, let's face it, that would make Christianity one of the stupidest religions around, because you would have a book, and that book, the scriptures, would be infallible. That would be your only infallible teaching. So when you got someone over here saying, oh, the book means this, and then you got someone over here saying, no, the book means that, you have no idea which of these guys are correct. You'd have an infallible book, and that's great, but if you didn't have another infallible source out there, 
you wouldn't be able to know who's got the correct interpretation of this book. Sola Scriptura is why there are so many different Protestant denominations, because all of them come up with these different interpretations, they don't want to agree on it, and they're like, well, I'm going to be my own church now, you guys be your church, and Sola Scriptura. They agree on that, they agree that the Bible is infallible, but nobody has any idea what it says. Which makes it hilarious that Mr. White actually debates stuff that's in the Bible, because it's like, why? You have no idea if you're right, man. You're saying the book's infallible, but anything you say, that might be fallible. Fortunately for Christians though, Sola Scriptura, piece of crap teaching. It's not Christian, it's anti-Christian, it's a Protestant thing. That being said, Protestants like Mr. White do try to pass off Sola Scriptura as if it's a Christian teaching, so let's look at why he's saying it's a Christian teaching. We'll start with these verses right here. So Matthew 22 verse 31, what does it say? Matthew 22 records a quote from Jesus. In verse 31, Jesus is asking a question. He says, regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus says, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So this passage in no way shows what Mr. White is saying here, that the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. This passage in no way shows what Mr. White is saying here, that the scriptures are ultimate in authority. What this passage does let us know is that God spoke and people wrote some of what he said down. So I can see how that could be used to support this part about the scriptures being theanostas, which means God breathed. I don't know why he switches between Greek and English. I think he thinks it's impressive. It's really not that great. Since they are theanostas, God breathed. Speaking of that, I was reading an article the other day. I think it was by Jimmy Aiken. We'll link to it in the description if I can find it again. But it's basically talking about how people do this. It's a useless thing where they just switch from the English word and go to the Greek to make themselves sound like really smart. It'd be like me telling you a story about how I was watching TV and then all of a sudden I hear this ringing and it just, it keeps ringing and I realize, oh, that's my El Telefono. My El Telefono was ringing. It's like, why are you switching to a different language when you could just say the telephone was ringing? Same thing here. This Greek word, theanostas, or theopneustas, or whatever it is, it just means God breathed. But you'll notice this kind of thing with false teachers like Mr. White, they'll try to complicate things so that you think, oh, they must be way smarter than me, I'm not gonna understand this. But trust me, by the time we're done this video, I'm pretty sure you'll know you're way smarter than this guy. So yeah, I could see how this passage can be used to say that the scriptures are God-breathed, it's God speaking, because it does say that God spoke to them, these words here, and it's asking if they read them. So God spoke words, and then people read those words, so it kind of is implied that somewhere in the middle there, those words were written down. But again, this portion of the teaching and this portion of the teaching they're not taught anywhere in that passage. So let's jump over to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1 says, Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All right, so again, this passage does not teach that the Scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith for the Church. This passage also does not teach that the Scriptures are ultimate in authority. It does teach us about prophecies of scripture, and specifically that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. This passage says that men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. But again, there's nothing in here that says the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. None of this portion of Mr. White's teaching is proven in either of these two scriptures. So now let's go to this passage right here, 2 Timothy 3. This is a letter from Paul to Timothy. And Paul tells Timothy, you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. As always, do not go to me as a pronunciation guide for these words. I have no idea if I said them correctly. Paul continues, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So now we're at the part where Mr. White wants to point something out, so go ahead, Jimmy. From childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So as soon as you have the, have the, the mention of the scriptures, they, they are able. Yes, good boy. The scriptures are able. They're able to do something. As I just read, the sacred writings are able to give you this wisdom. Now, before we move on, I want you to check this out. This is an iron. This bad boy is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. So just to recap so far, the scriptures are able to give you a specific type of wisdom. And this iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. So continue, Mr. White. So the scriptures have a capacity. 
True story. The scriptures do have a capacity. Very good job, James. That's what being able to do something means. Capacity, as defined by dictionary.com, means actual or potential ability to perform, yield, or withstand. So far, so good there from Mr. White. Since the scriptures are able to give you this wisdom, it can also be said that the scriptures have a capacity to give you this wisdom. Likewise, since this iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing, it can also be said that this iron has a capacity to get wrinkles out of clothing. All right, so this is going good so far. Mr. White has not yet deviated from the text of this scripture, which... It's kind of uncommon for him. So come on, what's, what's the deal, man? What's slowing you down? Jump those tracks. You know you want to. They have an ability in and of themselves. Oh, there it is. That's my boy. Yeah, I knew you had it in you, man. True Mr. White style. He says something that's true. He says another thing that's true. And then he slips in that false statement and hopes you don't notice. But people do notice and then they make obnoxious videos about it where they're playing with irons and sticking them on their face, getting that thumbnail shot. Like, hey, I'm on the phone. Did we get it? Did we get the shot? I think we got the shot. Yeah, that's the thumbnail. Anyway, yeah, that in and of themselves line, that's not in the scriptures at all. Mr. White just put that in there. They have an ability in and of themselves. So while the verse actually says the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, Mr. White is making it say the sacred writings which are able in and of themselves to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. By adding these four words to the verse, Mr. White completely changes what this verse teaches. For instance, let's use this iron as an example. We already know that the iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. But let's do Mr. White's sneaky little move there and add four words to that statement, in and of itself. So let's find out if that's true. I'm gonna get a little pedestal here for my iron. I'm gonna grab a wrinkly shirt from over here. Look at that. Balled that up and shoved it in the back of the closet for a week. That got nice and wrinkly. But that shouldn't be a problem for you, right? Because you're able, in and of yourself, to get wrinkles out of clothing. According to Mr. White, anyway. They have an ability in and of themselves. But, you know, it's weird because I still see all the same wrinkles in this shirt here. And they do not seem to be going anywhere. Are you broken? Or are you just shy? Are you able to do it in and of yourself and you're just deciding not to? What's, what's, what's happening here? Oh, okay. All right. He needs to be plugged in. That's my bad. Let me get that all situated. All right, so we've got electricity flowing to the iron, getting hot, and it is time for you to get those wrinkles out. Okay, I feel like this is just gonna be a repeat of last time. Why are you not doing anything? Oh, see, now I didn't know that. Apparently, the iron needs to be brought in contact with the wrinkles. So, yeah, we can do that. We've got this. All right. Yeah, we've got contact now. It's happening. It's, uh, it's definitely happening, but <sighs> gotta say, I'm still seeing the wrinkles. So that's, that's a little surprising because I was pretty sure that you were able to get the wrinkles out. And we are long past in and of yourself because we've got electricity. We've got me pushing you into the wrinkles. Yet, what is this, huh? Do you see that? That's a wrinkle. That's what you're supposed to get out. Oh, no, 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 come on, don't cry. Don't, don't do that. I'm sorry, okay? You know, it'd be funny there if I actually had the mist on and I made it squirt that out, but I don't feel like filling this up because I'm just, I'm gonna pack it away afterwards. I really don't iron stuff. But yeah, that would have been a funny visual to have with the don't cry joke. I just hit the button and the, the water shoots out like tears. But you're not gonna see that because I'm way too lazy to put that much effort into a joke. Sorry. All right, getting back into character. Don't cry. Don't cry, man. It's okay. Just just tell me what you need. Oh, okay, well, we can do that. As it turns out, in addition to all the other things that it needed, it also needed an opposing force while I pressed it into the shirt. So let's get down to business here. And all right, yes, you see, this is, this is getting those wrinkles out. I am liking the results. It's true. This iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. But it definitely was not true that this was able to do it in and of itself because I needed electricity. I needed me pressing the iron into the shirt. I needed an opposing force in order to have pressure on the wrinkles. This is, uh, this is definitely how a normal person irons, by the way. Just two hands, don't use the handle portion, just to prove to you that I actually do know how to use this thing. I rest my case. 
Ooh, that's fun. But back to the point, you can't just add the phrase in and of themselves to this verse. By doing that, you make the verse say so much more than it actually says, because when you add in and of itself to the verse about the iron, that means the iron can just get wrinkles out of clothing without any help. You don't have to give it electricity, it doesn't have to come in contact with the wrinkles, it doesn't have to have that pressure, that opposing force to actually smooth out the wrinkles. That's what it would mean if you add those four words to the sentence, but that's not actually true. This can't get the wrinkles out of clothing in and of itself. It needs help. So this verse about the sacred writings, it tells us that they're able to give us this wisdom, but it doesn't say if they're able to do that in and of themselves. Mr. White says it, but Mr. White also says a bunch of other things that aren't in the Bible. We looked at how Mr. White adds stuff to John 6. He adds stuff to Romans 8. But that's Mr. White's typical false teaching style for you. He doesn't actually have scriptures to support his false teachings, so what he does is he makes them up. Which actually does trick people into believing him when they just follow him blindly, but when they go to their Bible and they read what's really there, they're not going to find these words that Mr. White's adding. So that's why we're making sure we show people what Mr. White's adding to the Word of God. Because once Mr. White's followers end up seeing what he's doing, they can't unsee that. So by adding these four words, Mr. White has already made this verse say far more than it actually says. And Mr. White just continues to build off of what he just made up. What we have for verse 16 is about the ability of Scripture to accomplish something. It is a positive presentation of the capacity and ability of Scripture to do something. Well, what is... It's sufficient to make you wise for salvation. So now James has completely removed the word able, and he's replaced it with the word sufficient. It's sufficient to make you wise for salvation. Now I'm guessing that most of you watching already know this, but just in case Mr. White stops by, and just in case Mr. Durbin's watching, those are two different words. Able means having necessary power, skill, resources, or qualifications. Qualified. Sufficient means adequate for the purpose. Enough. This iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. It has the necessary power, skill, resource, or qualification to get wrinkles out of clothing. But this iron is not sufficient for getting wrinkles out of clothing. It's not adequate for getting wrinkles out of clothing. This is not enough for getting wrinkles out of clothing. It needs electricity. It needs something to bring it in contact with the wrinkles. It needs that opposing force to create pressure to get the wrinkles out. So again, Mr. White is editing the verse. He's taking out the word able and he's putting in sufficient. It's sufficient to make you wise for salvation. Able and sufficient are two different words. They mean two different things. You can't just swap one out for the other. And I'm surprised Jeff Durbin hasn't realized this yet. Pastor James, he's my teacher, my mentor, my hero of the faith. James is clearly just editing the Bible to make it say whatever he wants to say. That's really your hero of the faith? Is Judas in your top 10? Like, what's the deal here? Anyway, let's continue to listen to the guy that Mr. Durbin is fanboying out about, and in this next section, Mr. White is going to explain why he's using the word sufficient instead of able. If it's able to accomplish something, then it must be sufficient for that task. Okay? All right, so that's why Mr. White is swapping out the word able with sufficient, because apparently, if something's able to accomplish something, then it must be sufficient for that task. If it's able to accomplish something, then it must be sufficient for that task. That is not how it works, Mr. White. This is able to accomplish something. This is able to get wrinkles out of clothing. So let's go back to what Mr. White is saying here. If it's able to accomplish something, then it must be sufficient for that task. In other words, Mr. White would say, if an iron is able to get wrinkles out of clothing, then it must be sufficient for getting wrinkles out of clothing. Yeah, we're just gonna set this up again, and hey look, it's another shirt with wrinkles in it. Looks like the same one, but don't spoil the illusion, okay? All right, now, Mr. White believes that you must be sufficient for getting the wrinkles out of this shirt. So what do you say you go ahead and prove Mr. White right? Oh, you can't do that? That's not a thing? What he said is complete nonsense? Yeah, that's true. Mr. White's claim is that if it's able to accomplish something, then it must be sufficient for that task. That teaching from Mr. White is incredibly illogical. You see this phone here? This phone is able to call the President of the United States. But is this phone sufficient for that task? According to Mr. White, it is. But in reality, this phone is not sufficient for that task. I would also need to actually know the number of the President of the United States. Someone would actually have to dial that number. So yeah, just because something is able to do a task, that doesn't mean it's sufficient for that task. Mr. White just went way off the rails on that one. And seriously, Jeff, how do you follow this guy? Because he's my teacher, my mentor, my hero of the faith. Seriously, Jeff, if you're watching this video, please actually read the Bible. Stop being brainwashed by Mr. White. He acts like he's really smart. He switches in and out from Greek. 
Who cares? It's just an act. I'm an idiot, but I can still tell you that what Mr. White is saying doesn't make sense because it just doesn't make sense. Even to dumb people like me, I'm able to figure out, oh, that's not even logically accurate. Anyway, Mr. White goes on to read the next two verses in 2 Timothy. They say, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now that's from the NASB translation of the Bible. Mr. White ends up switching Bible translations here. He goes to the ESV because he doesn't really like the word adequate here as much as he likes the word complete. Now the New American Standard has, I think, a really meh, translation at that point. Adequate. Uh, the ESV, complete. Now I'm fine with either translation. I'm sure Mr. White is too. I actually agree with Mr. White on this. I think complete sounds a lot better than adequate these days, just because people hear the word adequate now and they're like, eh, adequate, that's all right. But complete sounds better. So I have no problem with Mr. White switching translations, but I do have a problem with something Mr. White's about to do. So Mr. White, first off, tell us what's important about this verse. The important point is right here, exartidzo, exartidzo. All right, so he's going Greek on us again. He says, exartidzo. What, what is exartidzo? Sounds dirty. Let me pop up a, a dictionary here. Exartidzo, to make someone completely adequate or, what's the word right there? Sufficient for something. Okay, so exartidzo means to make someone completely adequate or sufficient for something which means that according to this letter to Timothy, the scriptures can make the man of God completely adequate or sufficient for something. What's the word right there? Sufficient. Cool, so the man of God can be made sufficient with the scriptures. And guess what? The man of music can be made sufficient with this guitar pick. So what is it that has the potential of being sufficient in both of these cases? The answer is the man of God and the man of music. Notice how the scriptures and the guitar pick are never called sufficient. The scriptures and the guitar pick can help to make a person sufficient, but we're never told that the scriptures or the guitar pick are sufficient. That being said, Mr. White is about to try really hard now to make the word sufficient apply to the scriptures and not just to the person. So enjoy. It seems rather obvious to me that if the man of God is sufficient, completely adequate, made thoroughly equipped for every good work by that which is theanustos, that this teaches the sufficiency of Scripture to function as what? The sole infallible rule of faith of the church. I think that's what the doctrine of sola scriptura is, isn't it? Mr. White seems to think that it's rather obvious that if the man of God is sufficient, completely adequate, made thoroughly equipped for every good work by that which is theanustos, in other words, God breathed, then this teaches the sufficiency of Scripture to function as the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. So as an equation, Mr. White is basically saying if a person is made sufficient for a task by an item, then that item is sufficient for the task. That's not how things work here in reality, but let's just run through it for fun. So here's an item. This is my guitar pick. This makes me sufficient for the task of playing music. See, watch, I have a guitar. I have arms that can hold the guitar. I have a hand that can press down the strings that I want for the chord that I'm playing. And then I have this other hand that I can hold the guitar pick in. And then I can do one of those, maybe one of these. Throw in one of these too. That one's free. So yeah, this guitar pick has made me sufficient for the task of playing music. So the task is playing music and the item is a guitar pick. If we follow Mr. White's same logic, then if a person is made sufficient for playing music by a guitar pick, then the guitar pick is sufficient for playing music. So I'm gonna borrow you as our stand here and guitar pick. There we go. All right, play me a song. Dude, what's that? Oh, we can't play a song? Just to be clear here, I'm talking to the iron right now. I am not talking to the guitar pick. That'd be crazy, all right? Guitar picks cannot talk. But yeah, you were saying? Oh yeah, I knew that beforehand. This is not sufficient for playing a song. It can make me sufficient if I have it then I can be sufficient, provided that I have the guitar, provided that my limbs are working, provided that I know how to play the guitar. It can make me sufficient, but the guitar can also make me sufficient for playing music. My arms can make me sufficient for playing music. Maybe I don't even have a guitar. Maybe I have a flute or a trumpet or a drum set. Those things would also make me sufficient for playing music. But again, just because this guitar pick can make me sufficient for playing music, it doesn't mean that this little guitar pick here is sufficient for playing music. 
So yeah, again, we see Mr. White is teaching something that just simply isn't true and just doesn't make sense. That being said, I do find his explanation for it pretty hilarious. It seems rather obvious to me. It seems rather obvious to him. That was the extent of his explanation for all of the stuff he just said here. That'd be like me saying, it seems rather obvious, guys. I mean, if I have the guitar pick and it makes me sufficient for playing music, then if I have the guitar pick by itself, then it alone should be sufficient for playing music. Right? That's obvious, isn't it? I mean, listen. Listen to the guy. Right, they don't talk. I forget, they don't talk. Again, though, this obvious bit is something that false teachers will commonly do. It's not always bad to say something's obvious. Sometimes things are obvious. But I do find that false teachers like Mr. White will use the word obvious a lot, which I feel like that's a tactic where they're thinking, oh, I'll say it's obvious. That way people won't ask questions because they don't want to feel like the dumb person who doesn't know what's obvious. What Mr. White is saying there is not obvious. It's not even true. So when Mr. White says something's obvious, question him on it. Say, why is it obvious, man? Explain it to us. As you can see in our video, we didn't just say, hey, that's obviously wrong. We explained why it was wrong. We looked at the pic. We showed an example why that doesn't work. But Mr. White can't do that. He can't say it's obvious and here's why it's obvious. He could just say, it's obvious, guys. <laughs> Believe me. And then for some reason, Jeff Durbin does. But hopefully not for too much longer. Jeff, if you're watching this, you don't have to be his parrot. You could hop off his shoulder, stop just repeating whatever he says, and actually do some research. If you have questions, let us know. We can try to answer them. A good place to start might be these videos here on authority. As always, the links to those are in the description. So now let's recap. Christians believe that the sacred writings are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This is taught in the Bible in 2 Timothy 3. On the other hand, Protestants like James White believe that the sacred writings are able in and of themselves to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This is not taught anywhere in the Bible. This is Mr. White's edited version of the verse. Back to Christians, they believe that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is taught in scriptures in 2 Timothy 3. Going back to the other hand, Protestants like James White believe that all scripture is breathed out by God and sufficient for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is not taught anywhere in scripture. This again is Mr. White's edited version of the Bible verse. Okay, well that's it for this episode of Christian vs. Protestant. I want to thank at jbleaker09 for suggesting this video, and I also want to thank at Trent Horn for ruining the first video we had prepared. Yeah. It's on. Again though, check out his channel, it's really good. He puts out videos more often than we do, so get there, subscribe, click the bell, all that stuff. And share. Share our videos, especially if you know people who actually believe Mr. White or Mr. Durbin or Mr. Winger or any of the false Protestant teachers that are out there. Share this information with them. See if you can help them out. And remember, if you want to know how to be Christian, you drop the Protestantism and you keep the Christianity. You all have a great day. That's the only song I know.